Good evening. My name is Jim Oliver. I'm the uh, Seminole Campus Provost, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this campus this evening for this important dialogue on the ethics of being a citizen. Is it more than voting and paying taxes? And it's sponsored by the college's Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions and Applied Ethics Institute. Is it more than voting and paying taxes? I'll tell you the secret tonight. The answer is yes. Uh, at this time, it is my pleasure to invite the executive director of the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions, Mr. David Clement, to the podium to make a special presentation. Mr. Clement. Thank you, uh, Dr. Oliver, and let me add my welcome as well. Uh, thanks for all of you who turned out, the, especially the students, to learn more about what it means to be a citizen and what it means, what good citizenship means. And it is my pleasure to introduce Janet Long, project manager for the Institute, and she will be the moderator tonight. Janet is a former state representative and a former councilwoman, city councilwoman, so she knows a lot about uh, running for and holding office. Janet. I have my little bell. I just want everybody to pay attention that when you hear this, this is when you are supposed to stop talking. <laughs> just so you know. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for being here this evening. I hope you find our uh, facilities and our campus as engaging as we have tried to make it for you. And we're especially excited to see all of the students in the audience this evening. What a great time to be talking about citizenship, isn't it? With the national election just 352 days, 62 days away, that, start, that clock started ticking last Sunday. We're on the one-year countdown. We will be bombarded, every one of us, through the mail, through our email, and on television about who to vote for, who's the best candidate. Every one of them is going to say, vote for me. I'm the best one. On top of that, the opponents are going to start slinging mud and doing their best to make the other guy look really bad by making you know, make them look good by making the other guy look really bad. So how do you filter through what the real deal is and who is the genuine, genuine person? We hope to acknowledge that the basic duty of citizenship is more than paying taxes and voting. We don't really have a choice in paying taxes, but there is more to it than that, isn't there? This is the start, we hope, of engaging in a conversation about what it means to be a good citizen. Tonight, we're going to take a look at that subject from the perspective of a local, state, and national elected official. Each member of our distinguished panel brings to this conversation a certain expertise in their own worlds, and they have all or are serving in those capacities. We've asked them to get this discussion started this evening by sharing their views on some very provocative questions. And then afterwards, we're going to engage with you, the audience, to hear what kind of questions you would like answered. So when you checked in this evening, you all should have gotten a brightly colored a question card, I have one here to show you, uh, like this, or whatever color it is. If you have a question as you begin to hear the conversation, please write it down, and throughout the evening there will be some staff circling around to pick up your questions, and we're going to filter them through Senator Jones, and then he'll give them to me. Okay. If you don't have a card and you want one, raise your hand and a staff member will bring it to you. Our first speaker this evening is going to be our current tax collector, your friendly tax collector in Pinellas County. She just loves taking your money. As you can see from her biography in the program that you've been handed, she's held that office since 2001 and is the first woman to ever hold that office in Pinellas County. 
She becomes the president of the tax, Florida Tax Collectors Association in 2013, and she served on the Pinellas County Charter Review. For those that you don't know, she also happens to run all of our driver license offices here in Pinellas County, and if you've had to renew or get your license in the last few years, you know that she has established a model in the nation for how to do it right. So, next on our panel is someone who I've gotten to know very, very well. He was elected with me in 2006 to the Florida Legislature, Dr. Keith Fitzgerald. He comes to us from Sarasota, and he was elected from District 69, which includes Sarasota and Manatee. He is a professor of political science at New College of Sarasota and is presently at work on his second book. I bet you can't guess what the topic of his book is. It's citizenship, Representative Fitzgerald. Our third speaker is a virtual household name in Pinellas County, former Congressman Mike Bilirakis, who was a member of Congress from District 9 for 24 years before he retired in 2006. Before he ran for public office, he was an attorney. And I remember when he filed to run and we started hearing the name Bill Arrakis and everybody was thinking, Bill Arrakis? Who is Bill Arrakis? Nobody knows who he is. And we all didn't think he had a prayer. But boy, oh boy, were we wrong. He served us brilliantly for 24 years, and we are so proud to have him with us here tonight. So, we're going to ask each one of our distinguished panelists to say a few words to you about their perspective from the offices that they hold or have held, and then we're going to take some questions from our moderators. So, Mrs. Nelson. <clears throat> Thank you, Janet. You know, when she said, is it just more than taxes? Well, when you're the tax collector, that's all there is, is taxes. <laughs> and she introduced me as the friendly tax collector, kind of an oxymoron, isn't that? <laughs> anyway, I'd just like to add one more thing to my job title. I am a constitutional officer. And I am one of seven constitutional officers, which includes the tax collector, the supervisor of election, the sheriff, the clerk of court, state attorney, and public defender. While we all work together, the Florida Constitution requires that we each independently be elected. Just as there are reasons, sound reasons, for separation of power when it comes to federal and state levels, it is important that our local offices act independently of each other. As I was thinking about this event tonight, and I thought about my granddaughter who attends the University of South Florida, uh, I often ask her about her classes and she'll share them with me. And she'll say, oh, well, Grandma, she says, oh, some of them are boring and this and that. And then on the other hand, she'll say, and there are some that are so exciting. And she says, and I love it when the professors share real life insights and the principles that make uh, going to class fun each and every day. So it is my hope that you will find this discussion tonight not only interesting, but also beneficial and thought provoking. I'm hoping you will leave here thinking it was a good idea to have a panel of elected officials to talk about good citizenship. Just a quick overview of my office, because I think that's important before discussing what I think good citizenship is. Some people say that there are two certainties in life, death and taxes. My office only handles taxes. <laughs> One of the main functions of this office is to collect and distribute property taxes for Pinellas County and the many taxing authorities. In addition to property taxes, uh, my office collects uh, the, the county's tourist development tax. We issue driver's license and motor vehicle registrations. And we actually, that is a state function, as, and we are agents of the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles. So while the tax collector's office is part of the local government, our duties are spread out throughout with state and sometimes federal government. That's with the motor voter law. Over the years, I've seen a lot of events and changes in our society that are at the very heart of the issues of ethics and citizenship. I would guess that most of you, as college students, do not own real estate. 
That will likely change as you graduate college and move into your careers. More of you will become homeowners. Once that happens, you'll start to think, what is the responsibilities of paying these taxes? Where are they going? You have a vested interest in your local government. You become more concerned about the tax rates and how the money is spent and which program the government can fund. Once you become a taxpayer in your community, it's likely you will start voting in your local elections. But is that enough to pay taxes and vote? From my observations, I would say that citizenship in this country is more than just that. I know people are sometimes disillusioned with the political process, thinking that their vote doesn't matter. I often hear people say, why should I vote for the lesser of two evils? And I'll bet there's some people in here that are thinking that right now. My response is not only the fact that every vote matters in a democratic society, which we have seen in presidential elections, but exercising your right to vote is one of the most powerful ways to influence your issues in your generation. Take Social Security, for example. Now, I know it's a federal issue, but I think everyone can agree Social Security is going to be there for Diane Nelson, and I know that it's, going to, it's already there for Congressman Velarakis. But what about you? On the local level, I think it's even more important that you are engaged in what's going on. I know national issues sometimes draw more attention, but in local elections, there is more to consider, more officials to elect, more issues and amendments that usually affect your own community. As a citizen, I believe you have a responsibility to be engaged, and one of the best ways to do that is in the voting booth. Earlier I mentioned to you that my granddaughter is in college, and when I told her I was coming out to speak to this event, I said, what do you consider good citizenship? And she thought, and she says, Mimo, giving back to your community. I think she's right. So many times we approach things from the angle of what's in it for me. If you give back, if you think back to 2008, you will find Amendment 1, which passed by Florida voters. Amendment 1, among other things, helped property owners for certain homeowners. It was a statewide issue with local ramifications. Leading up to the 2008, you may remember that the real estate values were skyrocketing and were people and uh, people's property taxes. Florida voters wanted change. So they passed Amendment 1, which doubled the homestead exemption. And then the real estate market collapsed, which led to lower property values and less revenue for our cities and our county. We are not like the federal government that can continue to borrow and print money. Local and state government must balance their budget each and every year. Something else that came to mind the other day, and uh, I'd like to discuss jury duty. I realize this is outside our realm, but there was a recent editorial in the St. Petersburg Times that caught my attention. It mentioned how hard it was these days to get people to come um, and show up for jury duty. 1,500 people were subpoenaed, and there was 400 no-shows in, in Hillsborough County, thank goodness, not Pinellas. Jury duty is not something you look forward to, but jury service is one of the only obligations, in addition to taxes, of course, that we have as a United States citizen. The jury in that trial was quoted, the judge in that trial was quoted as saying, the people fight and die every day to protect our freedoms. One of those freedoms is a right to a speedy trial. But that, had, but that can't happen unless citizens hold up their end in the deal. Most everything that else that we do is a service to our community. However, it is done out of goodwill. I believe that's where we get the true heart, get the heart of true citizenship, is through goodwill. There is much to debate right now about our country, about the role of government, the sides of government, the government should do for us. Regardless of your political philosophy, I think we can agree that our founding fathers envisioned a nation where the strength of its people is what makes the country so great. They wanted a nation where the government at all levels, local, state, and federal, drew its strength from the people, not the other way around. For that reason, I believe it's imperative that as citizens we are involved and engaged 
with our government. One of my favorite quotes is from President Kennedy, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Yes, we vote, we pay taxes, and hopefully we respond when asked to serve on a jury. In my opinion, we also have a responsibility to participate in and give back to our community around us. There are certainly many ways to do that. Voting and taxes, while important, are really just a piece of the process. Well, that certainly gives us a few things to think about, doesn't it? Thank you, Diane. Representative Fitzgerald, can you come, please, and give us some of your thoughts for a few minutes? My bell in case you go off. <laughs> Jana knows me too well. She took her bell back with her uh, because she knows that I, I can talk. Um, I am a college professor in, in addition to a politician, so if you wanted to have a marathon for talking, you've, you've met your person, I can talk. But I'm gonna, I want to talk about this from a slightly different perspective, somebody who's in politics. I really am going to give you just a little bit uh, of professor talk about citizenship because it is something that I've worked on in my professional life, the concept of citizenship, the history of it as it's unfolded in this country. Uh, over the last 240 or 250 years is something that I work on very much. And I think there are some very important lessons uh, for us if we look at this history. Uh, and, and here's what I want to start with, with a theme. Uh, everybody you run into, whether they call themselves conservative or liberal or left or right or center or Democrat or Republican or independent or just disillusioned, and ticked off, everybody is angry about politics. Everybody hates politics. Everybody hates politicians. Everybody's dissatisfied and they're angry. Now, we know that whenever you have tough times economically, people's dissatisfaction with the political system goes up. So that's some of that story. And, and these feelings will abate a little bit if prosperity returns, and we all hope that it does. Uh, but there's something going on here, and we need to understand what it is. And here's my message for you. This is the theme of my talk. And it comes from an old cartoon that I read when I was a little boy called Pogo. And that theme is, we have met the enemy, and he is us. We have met the enemy, and he is us. We have lost the tradition of citizenship in this country that has made this a great nation. This country was not born perfect. Uh, it was not born finished. The founding fathers did not accompany Moses up to the top of the mountain and come down with the Constitution. What they came down with was a workable set of institutions that enabled the people to govern themselves. And the government we get is only as good as the government uh, of the people for the people, and most importantly, by the people. At the end of the day, in a Republican form of government, we have to take responsibility for the product. Uh, and that's my theme. And if you're unhappy with the way things are, I'm gonna finish with this and I'm starting with it. It's up to you to do something about it. And so is, is, is citizen just, citizenship just voting and paying your taxes? No, it is not. It is taking responsibility for governance. And it's taking your dissatisfaction to the streets. It's taking your dissatisfaction to the voting booth. It's taking your dissatisfaction to your classes. It's taking your dissatisfaction to positive and constructive action on the part of you, the citizens. And things will not get better in this country until that happens. Now, let me just start, since I am a professor, by telling just a little bit about how the Founding Fathers looked at the world and how it's different from where we are. First of all, the Founding Fathers were not primarily in their ethical outlook individualists. They did not say that the worth of everything has to do with me and how happy it makes me. That wasn't where they were coming from. A lot of people try to go read into later ideas into their thought 
uh, and talk about liberty because they're very much concerned with uh, oppressive government from outside to try to make them into modern day libertarians and, and, to, and to think that, they, that we should all be self-regarding uh, about our ethics. What does it mean for me? But that's not where they came from. They thought of politics as a realm of creativity in which individuals would find themselves through service for others in identifying and pursuing more perfect unions and that the, the reward was in the excellence that people could manifest in their pursuit of the common good. It's a very sophisticated and interesting way of looking at things different from us. For them, it wasn't so much about values as it was about virtues and was about moral character. This is the way they looked at the world. What was good for me was to develop my character, and what character meant was self-discipline, honesty, courage, uh, forbearance, virtue, excellence in all the realms of what it meant to be a self-governing person. That certainly meant part of citizenship was to try to be as economically self-sufficient as possible. Nobody should be trying to get a living off of somebody else if they wanted to be a good citizen. But it also meant that only thinking about, for instance, an educational process as a means of making a living was greatly irresponsible, profoundly irresponsible, unpatriotic. You go to school to learn how to be a good citizen so you can contribute and give back and make your community better and take your pleasure and enjoyment in the excellence you pursue in doing that. That's what education was about. And let me just say, in case you're missing it, if any bald-headed governors tell you that the only thing that's important about your educational process is how much money you're going to get when you get out of here, that is not the way this country is supposed to work. You're supposed to be figuring out, what can I do to make my country better? And one of the things you're supposed to be studying are political institutions and how they function and how they operate. The Founding Fathers uh, were engaged in something that is uh, a political theorist like me called the Machiavellian moment. Pearl Machiavelli, he gets a bad rap because he wrote about sticking heads on pikes and doing terrible things to people. People interpret him as saying, anything goes that's expedient to accomplish your end. But that's not what he was saying. He was saying that Italy is in a state of constant uh, uh, turmoil because it doesn't have well-functioning institutions and we need to build those and if I'm going to have to tell some not very bright prince how to do this stuff I'm going to be very blunt but what I really want are republics where citizens are in charge and so he studied that and the founding fathers followed in that tradition so as they engaged in revolution they thought deeply about how institutions were supposed to function they studied that, and then they put their ideas to action. Uh, and we have lost that tradition, because sometimes we think of politics as just another, another form of consumption. It's just another form of getting what you want. I take a little piece of value. We call it money. I go down to Best Buy. I just got a new iPad. I haven't recharged it yet. It's about to run out. But you know, it's a great device. I love it, a whole lot of fun helping me do my work, enjoy it. But that is not politics. I'm not supposed to spin my vote and get what I want. I am supposed to be building with you by contributing, thinking, working. That's what the American Revolution was all about. Now, we have lost this tradition, and, I, and I'm writing a book about this, so I have a lot more to say about this. There's a lot that went into it. It wasn't due to any one political party or one political ideology. A lot of things went into it. But it's up to us, it's up to this generation to have our own Machiavellian moment, to work hard to figure out what's going wrong, to think about it, to study about it, to get away from bumper stickers and simplifying the ideologies, really work through this. Why are our institutions not working? And I'll tell you one of the things that we need to do is think about how we can make participation meaningful at the local level again. How we can make participation in politics meaningful at the neighborhood level, at the level where ordinary people can do it and make a difference. Because if they do that, 
then their participation at higher levels of government will become much more meaningful and we will have better people working their way up the ranks, not just people who are looking for a professional advancement in the profession of politics, but citizens who are trying to make their country better. So that's it. But what I want to do is tell you we've met the enemy and he is us, but it's up to us to fix it. And if we work hard and work together, we can fix it. Thank you very much. Well, okay then. I've never been disappointed in Representative Fitzgerald's ability to get me all stirred up about something. Okay, next we have on our panel Congressman Mike Villarakis, who uh, I'm very anxious to hear his thoughts about what it was like in Congress when he was there versus how it is today. Congressman, thank you. Thank you, Janet. At, at, at the beginning here, I'd like to I see that Senator Dennis Jones is in the audience. Uh, I know Dennis. I've known him for many years. But I don't know him as well as some of the people in this room does, do, but uh, I would say that he, he basically has lived the, the, the good part, the good ethics in the legislature of the, of the United States, of, of, the, of the state of Florida these many years. And then uh, I see Susan is back there. I don't know Susan. She talked about red pepper. She's written those things. I'd sure like to read what she has written. Uh, but that campaign that she is referring to regarding um, former Senator Claude Pepper, who served in the House of Representatives with me for many years, a man who opposed me in my first race because I was going to destroy Medicare and uh, Medicaid and Social Security if I were to win, who became one of my best friends and one of my wife's best friends when we got to Congress and really got to know uh, one another. Uh, but in any case, that campaign is indicative of the worst, the worst of ethics that we can ever possibly imagine. And that was exhibited by a member of C Congressman Pepper's own party. It wasn't the guy from the other party that did it. It was a person in his own party in the primary. So uh, uh, ethics. You know, we get 20 people in a room and ask them to define what their opinion is of ethics, and you're probably going to get probably 20 different answers. Uh, you know, to me, it's how does one lead his life, his or her life? Uh, uh, there's no perfection there, obviously, but uh, how does a person live their, lead your life? That's, that's ethics. That's your own ethics. It's, an, it's really in the heart. It's a very subjective kind of a thing, because as I've indicated, 20 people, 20 different definitions. Uh, it's trust. It's uh, trust based on uh, an ethical foundation, if you will. It's philosophy. It's uh, being true to yourself, really, more than anything else. Being true to yourself. Uh, true to your clients, uh, true to your patients, true to your customers, true to your colleagues, the people that you work with, and by all means, true to your constituents. Uh, you know, when you stop to think about it, uh, ethical rules uh, surround us. They're really everywhere. I mean, it seems like uh, uh, that we've come to the point where uh, someone has to codify, if you will, and sit down and write it ethical rules on how people should conduct themselves. Uh, the, in our, in, in our, just the, our education system, you as students, uh, uh, some of you, many of you, I guess most of the people in this room take an ethics class. Uh, most I ga gather probably do not, uh, but you're concerned with it, uh, with cheating, uh, with plagiarism, uh, with things of that nature, rules, rules that the college has regarding uh, conducting yourself in an ethical manner as you learn and as you get your education. Uh, in the professions, in law, we have uh, the, the floor of the bar association. And believe me, if uh, somebody raises a point with the floor of the bar association, you're almost considered guilty by the bar, and you almost have to prove to them that you were not at the, I, I see that Keith is shaking his head. Yes, we almost have to prove to them that you haven't been, that you haven't violated something, that you haven't been unethical, uh, rather than the other way around. So there are rules that the floor of the bar has, and they, em they emphasize them, and the continuing legal education that all lawyers are required uh, to take includes a number of hours 
on ethics in various, various areas. They're taking those ethics now and, and breaking them down into certain areas, domestic types of ethics and things of that nature. So they're everywhere. The doctors are concerned about uh, confidentiality, about privacy. Uh, I remember uh, for years in the Congress, uh, uh, and I, I, I chaired the, uh, the health committee for, for 10 years up there, and I was responsible for all public health care, including Medicare, Medicaid, uh, NIH, uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration. We just go on and on and on, and our great big concerns was privacy. But nobody dared to even touch it because it was just so sensitive. It was, uh, uh, you know, how, how do you define this thing? What, what do you do regarding, regarding uh, the need for, for privacy? Uh, to me, ethics is, is interwoven or inter, inter, interwined with, with morals. I think it's really what it comes down to. Uh, so, you know, I always say, in fact, I, I talk uh, uh, oftentimes about um, my first campaign, and Dennis may remember this, where I got up on the stage during a debate and I told the audience of about a thousand people, I said, uh, don't believe us. We're going to stand up here, and if we're smart, we're going to tell you what you want to hear. Uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you know, just ch take, take what we say with a grain of salt if we're running for an office. But take a look at who we are, our background. And, 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 and Keith so much has said this. Our background will better tell you who we are and what we are going to do and how we are going to function in the future. Because you can take hours and days and months in years even, ask us our position on certain issues and not cover all of the issues that we're liable to run into when we're into office. And so it comes down to what's in the heart of an individual. And so uh, uh, the background is important, it molds us. Environment is important, religion, the Bible, uh, the Bible, the precepts of our church, uh, our friends, our family, all of this helps to mold us. And that's what makes us either ethical, ethical and moral, or not. The founders, uh, and, and, and uh, Dr. Fitzgerald uh, went into that area, which I oftentimes go into too. Uh, the founders were concerned about the same things that we're concerned about here tonight. Uh, and uh, that's why they cranked so many things into the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence uh, uh, set out all of the ills and the reasons they wanted the entire world to know why uh, they were, they, they were uh, uh, rebelling against this great, greatest nation, most powerful nation in the face of the earth. Uh, and they wanted the people to know why. And then they decided to solve those, those, those ills that existed back at that time with the Constitution. But the founders were concerned about what we're t talking about here today. They were concerned about the tyranny of the majority. They were concerned about uh, the, the, power f the power of the central government versus the states. And the states wanted to retain, of course, uh, many of their powers. Uh, and so they drew up, three of them drew up sets of Federalist Papers that we call, call them, and they addressed all of these issues. And they were very significant in terms of getting that Constitution ratified. Uh, the the uh, Constitution uh, is, is with all of its, uh, with the amendments and with the Federalist Papers and everything else, they wanted to make sure things moved slowly. They were concerned about separate, that's why they, they have separation of powers. This is why they have the checks and balances. Uh, this is why uh, at that time, if you'll recall, U.S. Senators were going to be elected by the legislatures of the various states, not by the people, as, as, as that is, which takes place today. Uh, they were concerned because they felt that was another check and balance by the states on the concern of a powerful central government. The veto power, of course, of the president is there as part of the check and balance. And you know, God knows how, to, how the bill becomes a law. It's a check and balance because it's slow moving through the committee systems and whatnot. In the final analysis, I say to you all that really it's what's in our heart. It's what's in our heart. No amount of rules can really, no, no statute, no nothing can force us to conduct ourselves the way we should. Uh, and who determines what we should do anyhow. But it's really in our hearts, and we're the ones who, who are going to who do that. Uh, although elected officials uh, are just like us, the rest of us, uh, and they have failings just like the rest of us do, they are highlighted by the press, they are highlighted by the public, etc. Thus, they are important role models for all. They are our representatives after all. Therefore, their conduct, our conduct, is even more impacting than most people's. 
Uh, and many people ask then, and I think this goes to the question of ethics, if you will, and morals or whatnot, how do you make your decisions when you have to cast that, that uh, yay or nay uh, in the halls of Congress or in the halls of the legislature? Uh, and, uh, and just uh, in county commission meetings or the city or whatever the case may be. Well, uh, are you, uh, um, all right, are you part of, of a group? Are you part of, of uh, are you a member of a, uh, there goes the bell. Maybe, maybe we'll, during the question and answer session I can get into some of these particular points because I think they're really very important to, to talk about is how a member of Congress or a member of the legislature casts the, cast our vote in terms of this, this, how they come to the decision that is so very significant. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you know, it's really a little uh, awkward to be ringing a bell on a United States congressman. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. So please excuse me, Congressman. Now we're going to begin the most interesting part of our discussion with questions from our very distinguished moderators. Let me tell you who they are. We have Dr. Lori King over here, who is the, an instructor in the Applied Ethics Department here at St. Petersburg College. And she is also a member of the Institute's Board of Directors. And next to her is David Clement, who is the Executive Director of the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. And next to him is Jeffrey Kronschnabel, who is an instructor in charge of St. Petersburg College's baccalaureate uh, degree in public policy and administration. So get ready, because they are really going to get some very interesting conversation going on here. Now, before I leave, can you please all hand your cards to this all the way down the side, and I'll walk around and collect them from you. All right, more from me in a little while. OK. Good. Good evening. Can you hear me out there? Um, let, me, let me begin by saying that uh, we are extremely fortunate to have this panel with us. I know one of the people on the panel for 40 years, another person for 30 years. They are consummate professionals, they're public servants. They are ethically and morally above any expectation that I would ever have in a public official. So we are fortunate. So some of the questions we're going to ask them are provocative and a little testy. So we would ask their forgiveness. Uh, we're not putting them on the spot, we're putting the system on the spot. So let me begin with the first question. Journalist William Moyers wrote, we hold our public officials to such a high standard, not because we expect them to be perfect, but because we know there has to be an image projected, an expectation aroused, a standard raised. The question is, as an elected official, should we hold you to a higher standard, even if it's not demanded by the public? Do you think we hold you to too high a standard? Your thoughts on this, beginning with the national representation from Congressman Bill Arrakis. Well, you better believe you should hold us to a high standard. I'm not sure that I could expand upon that any more than that. Uh, I, I uh, addressed it to, to some degree. Uh, we uh, are role models any way you look at it, whether we want to be or don't, don't want to be. And so we should be held to a pretty darn high standard, much higher than the regular person. Thank you. Well, I think that you should expect a higher standard for people in public service. But, but let me just say that I don't think that the way the news media is, con is constructed right now at the present time that it does a very good job of doing that, in part because it very often reduces very serious moral and ethical issues to trivialities. Uh, and it goes for spectacle and scandal without asking really fundamental and basic questions uh, about how government works and what's going on. I mean, you ask me, what is, why is government not responsive to the current concerns of average people? Whatever the peccadilloes of uh, a given congressman might be, what he does with his iPhone late at night and so forth, it's far more important that we have a political system where in order, and, and I am running for Congress, so you know, full disclosure, it's far more important that you have to raise huge amounts of money in order to be taken even a little bit seriously as a candidate. And that is not considered unethical. That's simply the way it works. And so I think that we should not only hold people to a higher standard, 
but the news media, media should high, hold themselves to a little bit higher standard of focusing on what really matters uh, and what the real concerns are. Fine to worry about personal ethics, but let's ask the bigger and tougher questions. Well, I certainly, I certainly agree with Keith in every respect, and particularly when he talks about the news media. Uh, the thing is, we can't really do much about the news media. The, uh, the First Amendment protects them to the point where they don't even recognize sometimes that uh, uh, for every right there's a, there's a corresponding obligation, a corresponding responsibility. They always point to the right, to the right that they have under the First Amendment, but not, not to the rest of it. Uh, but what we can do is we can we can't control them as much as we may like to, uh, but we can control ourselves. And so you know it goes back to of course basically what I said, and that is that uh, we should be held to that that high standard in spite of the fact that there are uh, there's a lot of unfairness, particularly on the part of the news media in many respects. Thank you. Ms. Oh, mine's a little bit different perspective from the local level. I happen to oversee 250 employees, and I think that standard has to be high if I expect certain expectations from my staff. I can't expect uh, me to come in when I feel like it and uh, you know, come in sloppy and expect uh, the public to look at me and be respectful. Uh, my employees have some difficult situations in sending customers out, and if you've come in to get a driver's license, you know that I've sent you out for a birth certificate, two pieces of residential ID, and your social security card. And at times it's not, it's not easy in my office, and it's not easy for the public. So there has to be a certain standard that I set and my expectations so that my staff has those same expectations, and when you come in, you are served with the respect that you deserve. So yes, we should have a higher standard. Second question or public official responsibility is, we are aware of how divisive partisan politics has become. In fact, it appears to be more fractious and contentious than in recent years. Do elected officials have a responsibility to lead by example, to step across the aisle, and put partisan politics aside in order to enact public policy for the greater good? And if so, how should or can an elected official do this and still get reelected? Look, Keith is running for Congress. I, I, I didn't know that. Uh, I still would have sat up here with him if I had known. But, but I, didn't know that. I assume he's running as a Democrat. Um, Keith is going to be involved in forums like this, candidate forums and whatnot, and he is going to answer some questions. He is going to express a philosophy uh, what he stands for, things of that nature, uh, uh, some liberal, maybe, maybe some conservative, some moderate, whatever the case may be. But he is going to get elected or not get elected on a basis of what he stands for. His, his, he mentioned something about the expense of running for office. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate, but much of that expense is to help him reflect and communicate to his potential constituents what he stands for. Now, when he gets to Washington, he's not going to forget that, nor should he forget that. After all, this is a, a representative government, and he's going to be representing these constituents. He told them what he stands for. Is he going to go to Washington and in the interest of doing what uh, uh, maybe his, his leadership tells him to do, or basically maybe personal philosophy or something of that nature, do something differently? Well, he will to some degree in many respects, but in many other respects, he's, he's got to remember what he told the people he stood for. And there are areas where he compromised. It's not as bad as, it's, as it seems, honestly. Uh, you have C-SPAN these days, and you have television, and everything, and this, everything of this nature, and what it makes it look even worse than it is. Uh, it, it was better when I was up there, during the, particularly during the early years. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, you have human beings in office, uh, and uh, they uh, they stand for something. We all believe in something. We. Uh, uh, you, are you going to get away from those beliefs because people tell you, hey, you should down and get this thing, sit down and get this thing compromised? A lot of things you will be able, as he indicated, to be able to sit down and compromise. I was famous for it in the Congress. I got along well with the Democrats. Uh, I really did. Gus now gets along with them, mainly through my reputation and whatnot. Uh, but at the same time, there are certain things you feel so very strongly about because you reflected that view that you're going to be true to yourself 
as far as those areas are concerned. And I should think it should be. Thank you. No. Um, mine's again a little bit different on the local level, and I'll give it an example of just what happened, and it gives me the opportunity to help educate you so that you'll know what's going on. If you're familiar with online travel companies, Expedia and so forth, you go out there and you go online and you book a room. I've been fighting this for 10 years, and I want to thank Janet Long. I'm Republican. She's Democrat. I went to her, and she helped uh, fight a bill. Of course, we're still fighting this, but the online travel company, when you as an individual go online and you book a room and you pay $100 and you pay taxes, $12 here in Pinellas County, seven state, five church development, that particular vet, uh, online travel company negotiated with the hotel for $50. So they, when you paid your $112 and they negotiated for 50, that hotel will receive $50 and sales tax of six. They pocketed the $6. That money is your money, it's my money, it's beach money. Those are the things that you have to understand. So I have been fighting that and I have just recently, Representative Christman called me and asked me if I would stand with him at the Capitol. I couldn't go there, but I gave him a press release because it is wrong. It's not, to me, it's more than just ethically wrong that they are taking money from you. That money belongs to the residents of Pinellas County in the state of Florida. And we could sit here and uh, help our revenue because we're talking millions of dollars that could be used here. And Beach Nourishment, $2.5 million of our money in tourist development bed tax goes towards beach nourishment. That, I know some of the federal money is being left out, some of the state, we're hurting. Those are things that I will fight for. And when we talk about ethics, that is in my moral fiber, that I think this is so wrong and in violation of Florida law, and I will stand up with whoever will stand with me to make sure that that money comes back to the place it belongs. Thank you. That's a great segue into our last question under public official responsibility. On 60 Minutes last Sunday, and in today's St. Petersburg Times was an article on ex-lobbyist Jack Abramoff and the corruption that he influenced where he alleged to secure the favoritism of at least 100 elected officials in Washington, D.C. The question from your panel is, do our public officials have a responsibility to speak out against corruption in government? And if so, how would you suggest doing this? And what do you think would be the consequences of your actions or inactions? Well, I don't know. Um how much responsibility you should have to speak out against it. God knows you should have a responsibility to, to not abide by it. Uh, thank God, you know, I, I don't even know if I would know Mr. Aberhoff if he walked into this room. And thank God that he didn't consider me important enough to come into the room, to come into my office and ask me for anything, uh, which I probably would not have gone along with, along with anyhow. Uh, but there are people like that. And, and that's why I, I, I have to keep reiterating Know who your elected representative is. If you know who, who that person is, you're not going to have to worry about uh, an Abrahoff. You're not going to have to worry about it because you know this person is going to be above that. Why? These people come in. Uh, you have lobbyists. Uh, it's not a nasty word. It's democracy in action. You have political action committees. Yeah, it's not a nasty word. It's democracy in action. Uh, but your representative, it's trust. I used that word early on, trust. If you have trust in your elected representative, you're not going to worry about that because those people are doing a job. I think they're doing a, a, a dirty job, if you will, <laughs> acting that way he did. But they still have a job. They're trying to make a living and that sort of thing. And they get an awful lot of money. And they're going to come around and they're going to give you some temptations, things of that nature. So they're doing their job, which is a terrible job, dirty job, but they're doing their job. I could never do it. I decided when I retired, I was coming home. I was not even going to be a lobbyist, and I'm not. But my point is that trust your elected representative, and then you won't have to worry about people like that. Um, well, you alluded to the Federalist Papers earlier. And, and by the way, my interpretation of uh, what the revolution was about a little different than you. I, I think what the Founding Fathers were really focused on, especially uh, Madison, was popular sovereignty. And they varied very much from one context to another about what the role of the federal government versus the state governments would be. Uh, Madison went to the Constitution in his back pocket with a pet project, which was to give the federal Congress a veto over state legislatures. 
It was based on his experience of having served in a state legislature for a few years. He wasn't really pleased with them. But his focus shifted uh, as time went on, and that happened. They wanted popular sovereignty. But one of the things he said in, in, in Federalist Number 51 is that if men were angels, uh, there would be no need for government. Uh, we're corruptible creatures. Uh, we are all, uh, we're all fallen angels. We're all sinners. Uh, we all have the capacity to fail. And so when you're thinking about what is the response to something like that Abramoff interview, you think about how are these institutions designed and how we can fix them. Uh, when I was in the state legislature, uh, Senator Dan Gilbert and I came up with a proposed constitutional amendment. Uh, no late filed bills, no, no uh, amendments in the last week of the legislature. Why? Well, because anybody who's watched the state legislature in the last week knows that's when all the really bad stuff happens because they come in and do late filed amendments, strike all amendments, 70 page bills suddenly are replaced with different 70 page bills. Nobody knows what's in it because there are you know, 100 bills considered in the last couple of weeks. The point of my story is you figure out what that problem is, anticipate people's flaws and try to fix it. So Representative Abramoff, or uh, a lobbyist Abramoff says, he got to these guys by promising their staff members that they would have big, high paying jobs with lobbying uh, firms uh, waiting for them right when they got out. I think a, a simple, straightforward fix to that is that people should, who work in a congressional staff should have a two year waiting period before they can go to work for a lobbyist. Right off the bat, that would lessen that kind of corruption. Uh, it would be tough for some people. Some people go up there thinking I'll serve on a staff for a while, you know, and make my way into lobbying court. Two years would be a good amount of time to lessen that. So that's what the response should be, not just false outrage. Let's, let's figure these things out and fix them. Let's get that job done. Again, I'm so different these state and federal. Uh, from the local perspective, me as a, I'm up for election next year and I'll have a fundraiser. And when it's all said and done, I have to deplete that money, return it back to uh, those, or I can give it to a 401c, which I have done with the Art Foundation and St. Pete College here. Um, I don't have any money to do anything with. I mean, if, it goes, if I go to a dinner, I pay for it myself. If it's a hundred, if anything is over a hundred dollars, I have to report it. It's not worth it. So, whatever I do, I pay for my own way. If I buy uh, a picture in my office, I pay for it myself. That's just who I am, and that's the way it is with me. So, um, I can't carry over monies and keep it and use it and so forth like you do. I don't know if you can do it in state. And I know for the state, you can't spend. You can't even take a cup of coffee from somebody. I think they've gone way too far now. It's almost ridiculous. Uh, and I have to, to defend that. I think that that's wrong, too, when you can't go sit down and have a cup of coffee. And I, have, I meet with the people with the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles frequently, and they cannot even accept a cup of coffee. And to me, that is so stupid. So we, we've taken this, and we've gone one way. Uh, the spectrum goes one way too far, and uh, oh, I'll throw in a couple tidbits. I think that we should have more than two years for our, our congressmen and our elected officials. All they do is one year you go and you try to do government, and the next year you're out campaigning and raising money. I think that is so wrong. I think they need to extend them, and people, I don't know if we can ever, ever get them to understand, they need to be there long enough to know what's going on before you're out there campaigning again. So perhaps maybe one day the people will get wise again and realize that you do have the ability to vote people out of office when you've had enough of them. And you can, and I happen to be one of those that voted out an incumbent, so it does happen. Can I, can I just follow up at one little thing, because you alluded to something sort of interesting. Another bill that I had, and also Dan Gelber had at some point, was something we called the Muffin Bill. Uh, and the reason we call it the Muffin Bill is what you're alluding to, the ethical rules, this is, goes back to my previous theme of sort of trivializing ethics rather than thinking about what's really going on and fixing the problem. Uh, in the state level, you cannot take anything of value. So if you're standing in line uh, at breakfast and you discover you left your wallet at home and you happen to be there with somebody who's a lobbyist or works for a lobbyist or knows a lobbyist, is a cousin of a lobbyist, I'm exaggerating a little bit, they can't buy you a muffin for breakfast. Against the rules. You know, the reporter's there, you, you, know, you have to make a big show of writing an IOU or something if you're really hungry. I'm not kidding. On the other hand, if that lobbyist said to you, I tell you what, I'm gonna fly you down to Miami next weekend 
to talk about a soft money fundraiser so we can put $100,000 uh, in your party that, you know, won't be earmarked to you but might just end up in your campaign, that's okay. That's okay. Okay, so we had this muffin bill, the idea being uh, let's focus on that soft money. Uh, let's, let's stop that flow of money. And, and that's what I mean by sort of the trivializing this stuff. We need to fix some of these rules, but we have to focus on what's broken. You don't buy people off with a muffin. You buy them off with that $100,000 uh, trip down to Miami to give, them a bunch, give their party a bunch of soft money, and that's what needs to be fixed. Well, it's, it's, it's certainly difficult to, to disagree completely with, uh, with Keith uh, on, the, on that point, because uh, I don't disagree with him. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, yes, J uh, Mr. Madison did say that people are basically not pure and that sort of thing, so you got to have, some, have to have some safeguards. And by the way, I, I, the Declaration of Independence, what I said was that uh, uh, the, the things that they were complaining about are reflected in the Declaration, and they felt from a PR standpoint that they must t declare to the world why, you know, they're, they're rebelling and that sort of thing. Uh, that was the point that I was making. But, you know, everybody is not corruptible. Um, the, the, the Congress has gotten tougher on um, uh, these things, such as accepting meals and things of that nature, just in the last five or six years. Since I left, they've gotten so tough. I, uh, Gus, uh, uh, my son Gus, who replaced me, as, as I guess may, many of you know, uh, you know, at times he tells me, Dad, I you know, I can't do this. I said, Gus, why not? He said, well, because it didn't, it, it was not unethical. I mean, it was not, from, a, from, a, from a, a written standpoint, it was not unethical back then, but it is now. Well, what the heck's happened? You have just as much corruption now as you had back then. They, they, uh, um, the, uh, what's his name, uh, 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 McCain and, and uh, the guy Frankel. from Minnesota, Frankel. Wisconsin, yeah, came up with this legislation on soft money and things of that nature. It hasn't changed anything. I mean, yes, we have to do these things. Yes, we need four-year terms. That would cut down as far as the money is concerned. And yes, we, we need the things that, that, that Keith is talking about. But again, it, it's here. It's in the heart, for crying out loud. You can't legislate. You can't legislate this, these sort of things. You can do the best that you can with them. Uh, it still comes down to knowing, darn it, knowing who your elected representative is likely to be, getting to know that individual, and uh, that that would help to, tremendously because you can't, uh, you just can't legislate a lot of these things. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm going to switch the topic around a little bit. We, so my question is, do you believe that the citizens that are involved in Occupy Wall Street are they being good citizens? or are they disruptive and unproductive? What, what's, what's your view on what, what's happening with, with uh, Occupy Wall Street? Well, I'm not sure really yet that we know what it is. Uh, you know, they just don't seem to have a, a theme, if you will, and uh, uh, so that's, sure, any, any time, and, and again, Keith said this, any time that people raise their voices and complain about things or ask questions and, and whatnot, and want to know more, that's a good thing. It's a darn good thing. So in a sense, it's a very good thing. I really think it is. Uh, but you hear all kinds of rumors about who, who put them up to it and, you know, and that sort of thing, and what do they really stand for, and what is it do they really want? I mean, you know, we talk about the Tea Party and things of that nature, but you know what they want. They have a black and white, whether you disagree with it or whether you think they're too radical or whatever the case may be, the point is that they, they know what they, they stand for something. You know what it is. But this group, we don't know enough about them as far as I'm concerned. Well, I, I do, do agree that we don't know what the definition of this is right now, and it's probably really dangerous for any of us to say we endorse something about it because if somebody else goes out and burns down a bank or something tomorrow, we all look bad. Um, uh, and I also think it's a little unseemly when, when political figures like Ralph Nader run down there and give a speech like he's in front of the parade. Uh, this is a, a movement that's coming out of uh, the people, and it's their movement, and they have a right to define it themselves. So, but just in general terms, look at what's happened. We've changed the topic. 
So for years, people in the political consulting business, many of whom are good friends of mine, I'm not running them all down, they're experts at changing the topic. So if the political system is not being responsive to the needs of the people, there are consultants on both sides, uh, maybe one side's a little better than the other, but both sides, uh, who will figure out ways of coming up with some red meat emotional issue uh, that will get people stirred up, uh, but it doesn't focus on issues. So here we are in the middle of this economic recession. Uh, unemployment, uh, over 9% for two and a half years now. Um, the, the, it appears pretty clear, I think, to most of us that the whole problem was caused in large part because um, the political system was not being sufficiently vigilant. This problem economically started in the private sector, but it was largely because of uh, too much of a cozy relationship between people in the political sector and the economic sector. And Washington hasn't been doing anything about it. They're not even, you know, they, they're not even really figuring out what, what can be done. Even if the, what can be done is nothing, they're not doing nothing in a principled way. Um, they're still up there trying to say, well, let's have a national, uh, uh, pass a bill saying in God we trust is the uh, national motto. Is that really the biggest problem we got in this country right now? Come on. And these folks, just by going out in the street, have gotten people talking about, well, well heck, what is the role of government in, in fixing the economy? Uh, has it been too skewed in favor of some people other, other, uh, rather than others? Are there things we ought to be doing about that? That's the power of the people. So can't endorse everything they say because we don't know who they are. We're not exactly sure where it's going. Uh, but it shows you what the power of the people are and why people should lead the politicians rather than the other way around. The good things in this country throughout its history have come from the people. Uh, and, and in that level, in very general sense, uh, I think we should be heartened uh, by the movement, even if we don't, uh, can't say we endorse everything about what they say or do. Well, <clears throat> I saw the movement, uh, movement is starting to have been something at least good where people were coming out there and expressing their frustration, perhaps maybe not having a job and so forth. But now as, as time has gone on, I think they're out there and um, a bit disorderly. I see millions and millions of dollars being used. Oh, God, I can't stand it, but I do <laughs> deal in dollars and cents uh, on overtime for law enforcement. That, to me, is money that could be used to help people, all because we have a group of people who decide that they want to party and have a good time. And I'm sorry, that's just the way I feel about this particular item. And I was listening to Martin Luther King's uh, niece the other day on TV, and they asked her, what do you think of this movement and so forth? And she says, you know, my father and my uncle would not, you cannot compare this with the civil rights movement because now that's what they're trying to do is use that as a civil rights movement and comparing what's happening. And that's not true because she says, my father and them, they stood for order, they stood for love and peace and getting things done. And she says, my father and my uncle would be out there praying right now for us to have some wisdom to make things good. It has been nothing but greed to me is what started all this. And it's not just the banks, it's Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These are the people who just now got Got millions of dollars in compensation at CEOs right now and we don't hear that we only hear about the banks and you have to have people that had the greed and the people had to have a house and people can't afford a house not everybody can have a house that's not what we're here for and so here we try to push those things it's a good thing everybody wants a home I have a home I want everybody to have a home but you know it's not not everybody can have a home and it may sound uh, heartless and whatever but you only make uh, so much money and people, you know, we used to look at 25% of your income going towards your house payment. Now it was like 50. They were putting people in houses that they could not afford. And now we have these failures and the foreclosures and all of this stuff that has come down. And our people can't, and our men that do construction for homes and they don't have jobs. So there's a lot of things that is going on. And um, I don't know if this movement is what is really uh, helping it at all. Well, we want to make sure that we leave time for questions to answer the questions that you and the audience have asked. So, Senator, do you have, do you have them? We're going to get started on that a little bit. Okay. 
Here's our first question from the audience, and any one of the three of you can answer it. The statement here is that government is broken at all levels. It's corrupt, it's immoral, it's unethical. So how can we expect society to live morally, ethically, and virtuous lives? Our leaders and parents lack the, these skill sets. What needs to be done to correct this? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the sort of the implication of the question is the causal arrow is that the corruption starts with the government and it moves down to society and the people. And, and part of what I'm saying is that we have our own personal responsibility uh, to try to fix these problems. We can't wait. I mean, it, it does, I, I understand, I'm running for office and you think, okay, you're one of them. One of the things that happened to me, first time I ran, I hadn't uttered a word as this, I came up to one of these forums and uh, I had never said a word as a candidate. Uh, and somebody puts their hand up and he says, I want to talk to the politician, all you people are alike. And I thought, wow. And I just filed on Tuesday. <laughs> I haven't said anything, and I'm just like all the rest of them. You haven't seen uh, anything yet. Yeah, I know. Uh, so, you know, so, but, but look, we are the people. You know, you can't wait for the political system to produce a bunch of angels and saints to fix this thing. We have to fix it. Uh, it's, it's not coming from them. It's got to come from us. Uh, so, but there are some institutional things we can do, and that is I think we need to expand civil society. Uh, we've got to create opportunities for people to participate in neighborhood politics, in their churches, in their communities, in their cities, in their towns, in planning processes. The more people participate, the more knowledgeable they become, the better they act when choosing. Uh, leaders at a higher level, the better the leaders are because they come out of those backgrounds. So we really need to reinvigorate political institutions at the most local level, even at the neighborhood level. That's a long project, but it's a start. Okay, well, this, I, this question is for Congressman Bill Arrakis. During the Republican presidential debate, Ron Paul was asked, what should happen to people who did not have medical insurance and would die without medical care? Someone in the audience let, yelled, let him die. Ron Paul said, we all have choices to make with our money. Your thoughts, please. Well, you know, that's, that's, that's because we're talking about uh, the president's health care bill. That certainly is almost at the top of, of the agenda these days. Uh, uh, you know, what, what is the role of government? Uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I helped to formulate the, uh, uh, the Part D in Medicare. Okay, uh, I was chairman of uh, one of the committees and their chairman from the Senate and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, government should be involved to some degree, but you have a constitution and the constitution sets out the powers of, of the legislature and the powers of the, of the presidency and whatnot. And uh, uh, I, it, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't agree with Ron Paul, let them, let them die or whatever, whatever his comments were, I heard them too. Uh, but. Uh, uh, again, it goes back to what, the, what is the role of government. Uh, the reason that we got involved, many of us got involved in adding Part D to Medicare is because we already had Medicare, and it was not, the one area that was not being covered was prescription drugs. And living in this area, I, I knew the problem that many people were, were having with that, and so uh, we decided to add that to it in order to strengthen Medicare. Uh, so, you know, what do you do? I, uh, I don't know. We. Uh, uh, we just don't get together. I mean, it's one of those areas where we don't get together. We had an opportunity a few years ago to do something about that. Uh, uh, and we had legislation and, and the other party shut it down and, and uh, uh, this party shuts it down and that back and forth. Uh, but, you know, government is, is not broken. Uh, Winston Churchill and others have made comments about this system of government and, and uh, you know, the. Uh, what is it? It's, what, it's, a, it's a bad system of government, democracy. It's a bad system of government, but it's the best that the world has ever seen. And it is. And it is. And compare, I'm not saying that we should compare ourselves to other countries, but take a look at all these other countries and their system of government as related to ours. Uh, and, you know, and again, you elect people to, who reflect your point of view because you've heard their point of view during the campaigns. And I think, I should think you would want them to be consistent with that point of view. Um, I, I wish we could do something about the health care problem in this country, but we have an awful lot of problems in this country, and health care is not the only one. We, I mean, again, uh, 
how much should you depend upon government to do for you? You, do, you settle the health care problem, then you go into maybe something else, and, and then, then before you know it, you become, I guess, Greece or, Turk or, or, or Italy or Spain or one of these other countries. Okay, this next one is for all of you, uh, and I'm sure that most of you, that you'll all be able to relate to it very well. In a campaign, there are an awful lot of slander and libelous claims made about the other person running. And both parties are guilty of doing that. And so the question is, do you think slander and libel laws should be strengthened, and should it be easier to prosecute for slander and libel? And most of the time, you know, a lot of times you don't even know who it is that's creating the message that's so awful. But we've all seen it in our television uh, nightly, and it's going to get worse as we get closer to Election Day. I think it would be very difficult to try and prosecute someone. And we have, to me, a very weak ethics committee here in the state of Florida. And people file ethics claims and so forth, and by the time it gets around to it, the person's been elected. What do you do with them afterwards? The damage is already done. Uh, I, I just, I am fortunate that I have not had to deal with it, and I've seen it. I find it despicable. I think you should always try to take the high road, but, and the, and the sad part is, is that we, as everybody in this audience, will get more into the dirt than they will to sit there and listen to the good things. You should demand that you want to know what that person is going to do for you. But we get into that slinging in the mud and the dirt, and you all enjoy every bit of it. Let's face it. There's some, we say we don't, but we do. And it's like the accident. you got a car accident over there. Oh, my gosh. Poor, we're sitting there. Our necks are so driven out here looking at that accident. That's more exciting. You look in the paper, what we read. What do we read in the paper? It's always the worst, the gloom. Do you see anything nice happen? We do get a couple extra. We get some articles in there that do uh, make you want to read the paper I might, occasionally. I might but it's usually the person who is not slinging the mud who wins the races. I don't know about that. <laughs> I, do. I, do. I can, I do. Att I can well, attest to some of that. Yeah. All right. Now, um, this is for all three of you again. Why do you think that apathy continues to grow with U U.S. citizens, especially when it comes to the turnout on Election Day? or doing our voting cycle? I wish, I wish we knew. I wish we knew the answer to that question. Maybe we could try to address it somehow. Uh, Not again that you can uh, legislate I, all these things. I'll just tell you what my granddaughter said, and that's why it got put in my little speech. Why do I want to vote, vote for the, less, the lesser of the two evils? Now, this is somebody who lives with this hardcore elected official here. And um, she says, I don't know. I'll just see. So, and she's with me, and uh, she's very in tune with what's happening in the world. So I got to work on her a little bit longer to get her out there because it's very important. I take her out to all my functions. She's very active and so forth. But she hasn't crossed over that, and I don't know. And I, and I have to tell you, it's just like, you're, believe it or not, you need to pay attention. And you are the ones, the generation that's going to be paying for a lot of stuff. I told you I'm going to have my Social Security. You already have yours, right? I have, I'm going to have my Medicare. I'm going to have all of that. It's going to change. It will change for you. You need to stay in tune with what's happening. And everybody out there to vote. And if, they, if you're not registered, you need to get there and register to vote. You can do it online. How much simpler can we do? We just had an election in St. Petersburg. The majority of them were mailed. They were ballots that was mailed to the home. How few of people went out there and voted? Pretty disgusting to think how little people went out to vote when you look at 500,000 people there in St. Petersburg. So uh, I don't know what the apathy well, is you know, about makes, people. I it just makes get you wonder. Uh, uh, somebody said something. Many people, all of them. And we we hear it all the time. The government is the, the government is busted and that sort of thing. Maybe we as a as a as a society are busted. Okay. I tell I tell the story. Uh, you know, some of the impacting things in 24 years in the Congress. For one was uh, we, uh, we were s s very strongly supportive of free elections in, um, uh, oh, geez, what was it, Nicaragua, El Salvador, one of the Central American countries. Uh, and we wanted to have democratic elections down there. So we sent a team down, we the Congress, gov the government up here, sent a team down there to, to uh, monitor those elections. And one of them is Jim Wright. 
Jim Wright was a Democratic uh, Speaker of the House. Uh, Jim, uh, along with, well, Jim was not supportive of what we were doing, the aid to be given to those people down there. We wanted to send aid down there, but we wanted to make sure we had some assurance of free elections. But he went down there, and I remember to this day, he came back and stood on the floor of the house with tears running down his eyes, talking about seeing these women with their baby strapped behind them, hundreds of them streaming in out of the jungle with, with automatic weapons being pointed through the trees to try to intimidate them, to make them turn around and go back. And they kept on coming. And it was something like, a, you know, this year's now 90, 95% turnout. Mm -hmm. And he was, and he changed, he changed his complete philosophy on helping that particular Central American country as a result of what he saw down there. We just had that. We, we used to be that way maybe, but not, not anymore, unfortunately. And I have to say one of the things that I've done in my organization is that I've tried to do uh, bring, uh, you have to get your employees on board. And we do that through a lot of terrible uh, plates that we do and we have a systematic approach the way we go about it. We develop a criteria and I bring in the, the, the organizations that we have that come into our, uh, they have to fill out a, uh, uh, an application, whether we're gonna consider it, are they gonna give money back to our community? And my staff votes on those. So it's getting people involved. I don't know how you actually do that, but we have to stop what's in it for me. Okay, well here's another question that may help give us some answers. Okay. All right. I think we can all agree that children need to be educated about our government because it's the only way that we can really keep it going. So to some degree, do you think that this could be indoctrination. Do you think this is the case? Why don't we teach civics in our schools? What are the implications of the fact that we have stopped teaching our children about government? Well, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's totally absurd. Um, and part of the reason it's absurd is sort of following from the last question, is part of people's sense of apathy is that they don't, a lot of people, very few people actually have a, a clear sense of causality in politics. I mean, what, how policy affects their lives. What works and what doesn't work. What are the range of reasonable opinions? I don't think civics is anywhere near enough. I mean, if you're, if you're learning that kind of stuff about the separation of powers, I, you know, I hope you, you all are, and I know most of you aren't. And that's all fine and dandy uh, to learn a bunch of little facts and a little stories about founding fathers and that kind of business. But government is so much more complicated than it was at the time of the founding. The, the workings of a capitalist economy and the interrelationship of public policy with that economy, just to take one example, is massively complex. I mean, if you try to explain to average people how Medicaid D is financed, how it actually operates, what the actu actuarial tables are as it looks out over time, how it relates to the other forms of financing, most people have just completely zoned out. You know, so, so it's really difficult. We have to do a lot more than civics. People need to have a basic sense just to be a competent citizen uh, of economics. They have to have a basic sense of political science. Uh, founding fathers, by their standards, their times, were all political scientists, seriously. Um, so I don't think civics is even enough. But look, in a republic, if the citizens don't know how the system works, they can't possibly be in charge of it, right? There's no conceivable way. Would you go to the store and pick this thing up and say, well, I, I don't have a clue how you operate it. Actually, it's, it's a Mac product, so you'd figure it out. Uh, but if it's you know, some other brand, it would take you a, a few months of manuals to figure out how to do it. Of course you wouldn't do that. So you, know, you get angry at how the system works. We need to do so much more than just civics. People to just be informed citizens. And I'll just give you a little bit yet, and then I'll shut up. Um, there's an international organization that occasionally assesses people's knowledge of geography. Their idea of geography is more than just maps and so forth. It's how people live in different regions of the world and so forth. It just so happened, within a few weeks of us uh, the United States invading Afghanistan, that they did an international survey of knowledge of geography. 
and of all of the advanced industrial countries, the country that had the fewest number of people who could find Afghanistan on a map was the United States of America. Okay? Now, how, how could you, as a, your job as a citizen is not to just do what the military tells you to do or do what the government tells you to do. You're supposed to be an informed participant in the discussion about whether or not we should go to Afghanistan, what we should do when we do there, what's the scope and the scale of our mission there. You're supposed to be engaged in that. You can't find it on a map. How can you participate in that conversation? And it's no wonder you're going to be sort of disillusioned and, and apathetic if people are making big decisions that affect your lives and you don't have the basic toolkit uh, to know what in the heck they're talking about. So we need to be doing so much more in education to make us citizens of the world uh, because increasingly the United States is not going to be able to dominate uh, through sheer military power. We have to be more competitive economically. We have to be more competitive in so many different ways. We need to understand not just our country and our government institutions, but the entire world. And it's up to us to do that. If we can't do it, we're not going to compete. We're going to fall behind. Uh, so this is a crucial need for our country. Well, this question parallels the conversation that we're having right now. How does one citizen or a few compete against the powerful lobbyist it seems as though these issues that are funded so much by money have more influence than the people, even though their positions may neg negatively impact millions of the people in our population. I, that is, that is over, overdone. 24 years in the Congress, I can think of only one congressman who made a comment to me that when and he wasn't talking about the public, he was talking about a lobbyist coming into his office uh, and trying to get a favor or something like that. And he looked, he, has a, he had a roster. Now he was a kind of a political hit. He was, in, he was in, in the state legislature. He was involved in politics long before he came to Congress. But he had a roster. And he told me he looks up that roster before he even talks to any of these people. But that's the only one that I ever run into. And I'm not saying that that uh, there aren't other members of Congress who look at the money and, only, and, and, and let, it, let it basically uh, govern how they function and that sort of thing. Sure, we have, I mean, we have rotten apples in every bushel. Uh, but, you know, this, this corruption business and, and government is broken and things of that nature. You know, I say look in the mirror. Yes, to some degree it's there, but if you go back, if you go back throughout history, you're going to find it in every government. We shouldn't accept it. We should not condone it. We should not accept it. We should always be fighting to change it. There's no question about that. Uh, what do you do to reach the uneducated voter or the one-sided voter so that they can understand the whole story, especially in the age of technology now where we have uh, email, Facebook, Twitter, and television? It's a 24-hour news cycle of negativity. So how do you get the whole story out there for the average voter? In this day and age, it's, it's out there. It's out there. It's out there. It's up to us to get on there on the internet and look at it. I mean, I get all kinds of emails from everybody. In fact, I've had to unsubscribe because you can't. You're burnt out with all of that. Tweet, Facebook, this, that. Uh, it's out there. And to me, it it may be a, an excuse not to uh, go out there and do your homework. I mean, it's always easier to complain. And I and I have. Uh, a lot of the people that I talk to, and I have a lot of great customers that come in, I can assure you I have these little comment cards. You come into my office, if you're not happy with the service, you put a little comment. You will get a phone call from somebody. If you're not happy about something, or I'll pick up the phone, and if they've left their phone number, I'll call them. They are shocked to think that an elected official took the time. And, or I hear from uh, the state, well, we aren't, you know, the DMV in New York and California. And we, make, we take great pride in some of the things that we do at the local level. I can't tell you, you know, to me, I take your money. The only thing I can provide you is good customer service. And I focus on that. And my staff knows that from the minute you walk in to the time you leave. So I would suggest if you're not getting the answer, then you need to either knock at the door, write a letter, send an email, 
you don't even have to put a postage stamp. Of course, maybe the post office would want you to. Uh, they're into debt, but send an email to your elected official. I can tell you, I respond to them, and so does it my staff. So it's out there. It's up to you to go out there and look at that. Okay, now this is a tough, toughie because we haven't talked yet about energy, but who should pay for the $2.5 billion damages that were caused by Progress Energy in an attempt to complete a project that would have saved Progress Energy $240 million, and why? Progress Energy should pay for it. Amen. Okay, then. There, we won't get any argument on that, but I'll tell you who's likely to pay for it, and that's you. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be us. Again, if we start, sit back and let it happen, yes, it will be us. Yep. But on the other hand, if we get involved, petitions, letters, bothering, bugging your, your, your members of uh, your, your elected officials, it can change. And this is probably going to be our last question because we want to make sure that we uh, stick to our time frame that we told you about. How do you come to your decisions on which way to vote on a particular mm -hmm. issue? Well, that's what I started to go into. Um, and I guess there's really no black and white way to do this. Uh, you know, we're, we're all human beings. We all have biases. I don't care how much we may want to deny that, but we all have biases. Uh, we all are, are members of groups. Uh, uh, we members of certain eth ethnicity, um, or, you know, particular race, uh, uh, particular fraternal organization, whatever the case may be. Uh, again, we're, we're, we're molded and, and we're formed. And, uh, uh, you know, there's uh, the political theorists talk about the, the trustee concept and the delegate concept and the political concept, where the one concept says basically that you listen to your constituents, but that you do, as a trustee, you do the best that you possibly can based on your own knowledge. Uh, that supposedly means that you care more for your, well, if you're in Congress, you care more for the nation rather than, you know, the emphasis is not on the state, but the emphasis is on the nation. Uh, and then, of course, the delegate says that you are a delegate, a representative of the people, and you will do what the people tell you they, they want. And that's the delegate and the political, which is basically where practically everybody falls into, right, Dennis, is a political where you kind of do both. You're, you care about your constituents, so you listen to them, and uh, basically what their opinion is is, is very impacting. Uh, you, you, you listen to your staff. Uh, obviously, bias comes into the picture. If you're a member of a group, that comes into picture. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a Greek American. Uh, you know, what happens in, 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 even though I'm an American, and this is my country, uh, what happens in Greece, which was the country of my parents and grandparents, uh, is, is it, it, it affects me to some degree, not to the effect that I would pick it over the United States, but the fact of the matter is it's there. And you know, if you're Jewish, certainly you care about the state of Israel and, and the, the decisions involving the state of Israel, et cetera. So all of these things go into a mix, uh, but you, you do the best that you can. I, Some I would, people don't. Some people go right down the line. Some people go right down. Listen, the, the power of the leadership up there, forgive me, Keith, the power of the leadership, and, and if you were to succeed, I think you already know this, you would see that power up there, probably a lot more liberal than you personally are. Uh, but the, the power of the leadership is very impacting upon you and that sort of thing too. But uh, uh, again, it depends. Uh, it, it's, it's a matter of, uh, of trust. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, students and members of our community, I want to thank you so much for coming this evening. I especially want to thank our distinguished panel and our moderators. <laughs>